So good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, or good evening, where it is in your country. You're all very welcome to our webinar today. Libraries mean business, marking world, intellectual property day. So my name is Teresa Hackett. I uh, work with IFL, Electronic Information for Libraries, an NGO that works with libraries in developing and transition economy countries to enable access to knowledge. Our event today is co-organized with IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, the global voice of the library and information profession with more than 1,500 members in 150 countries around the world. So I'm delighted to be joined today by two colleagues from IFLA, Stephen Viber and Camille Francoise from the IFLA policy team. World IP Day is an annual event organized by WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization. And at WIPO, the library community is primarily engaged in advocating for global copyright rules that support libraries and the people who use them, especially in the digital environment. We also raise awareness among IP policymakers of library services and the needs of libraries. So taking the theme of World IP Day this year, which is IP and SMEs, taking your ideas to market, we decided to showcase the work of libraries in helping SMEs and startups to get their business ideas off the ground, or more recently in COVID times, to change the focus of their business. So studies show that when businesses are IP savvy, that is when they acquire and know how to manage their IP rights, they do better. And libraries around the world are helping SMEs, small businesses to become IP savvy. Libraries train in how to acquire uh, patent, trademark and design rights. And by understanding IP, they also help small businesses from infringing copyright or other IP rights from third parties that could end in costly litigation for small business. We also provide access to business databases and other expensive resources to research the marketplace for their new product. So we have three great speakers lined up for you today from three different types of libraries, a national library, an academic library and a public library. So first, I'm going to introduce our speakers who will give their presentations and followed by the Q&A session. So please Put your questions into the Q&A function and Stephen will be keeping an eye on the questions that are coming in and he will, uh, we, he will uh, moderate the Q&A session at the end. So our first speaker is Jeremy O'Hare, an information expert on, in IP at the British Library Business and IP Centre. And Jeremy presents the centre's IP workshops and one-to-one -one clinics working with a diverse range of businesses from all sectors, especially helping those who are at the startup and the growth level. Our second speaker is Tara Radnicki. Tara is head of the Delamere Science and Engineering Library at the University of Nevada in the US. And we're very grateful to Tara because she has a very early start uh, over in her part of the world. So we're grateful to you for joining us, Tara. Um, Tara also serves as a patent and trademark resource librarian, which is designated by the US PTO, the US Patent and Trade, uh, Trademarks Office, and she assists users both from the university and from the local community with matters related to patents and trademarks. And then our third speaker is Bernadette Coogan. Bernadette is a divisional librarian at Dublin City Libraries in Ireland. She's currently in charge of the Dublin Central Library, which includes the Business Information Centre, Music and Lending Services. Prior to that, Bernadette held positions in research and projects, including those funded by the European Union. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jeremy uh, to share your screen. And Jeremy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, great. Thank you, Teresa. And uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening, everybody, wherever you are in the world. Um, it's a real privilege to be able to be with you today on, on World IP Day and to share um, just a little bit about what I do and what the British Library uh, Business and IP Centre does um, to support businesses uh, to grow uh, and also to, to scale up. 
Um, so I've got about 15 minutes, so it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to fit everything in, um, but I'll, I'll do my best. So uh, the British Library here is obviously the National Library of the United Kingdom, and we're based in, in central London in St Pancras. Um, we are just beginning to reopen uh, after a, a very long lockdown uh, here in the UK, uh, and our reading rooms are now just starting to, to be open to the public uh, for bookings. But within the, the business, uh, within the British Library rather, uh, we have a, a reading room, as we call them, uh, called the Business and IP Centre. And this space is dedicated to supporting uh, those that are interested in starting a business, who perhaps maybe just have an idea and don't quite know what to do next. Um, to those that are more established uh, with their business, they want to perhaps do some more research to expand into a new market. Uh, it might be a new product design, for example, or looking at export opportunities. Uh, and, and other uh, business researchers as well, um, as well as students that will sometimes use our space too. So it's a, it's a wide audience that we support, but our focus in particular is really supporting those um, small and medium-sized uh, businesses. Now, what's unique about our collection, if you like, is that we do sit within the broader British Library as the National Library. That gives us quite a few advantages and that we have access to a huge range of material, obviously not just in business, but in every other uh, subject you could imagine. Uh, but within the business and IP uh, section, we, are, we do have access to uh, market reports, some in print, but less so nowadays, uh, but more importantly to a wide range uh, of online uh, databases that we subscribe to um, from a whole lot of different publishers. Uh, and this means that our, our SMEs, our business researchers, are able to access um, up-to-date, uh, sometimes up-to-the-minute information um, on whatever it is that they're looking to do. And that information tends to be divided into to market information, uh, company information, uh, news and, and uh, trends, and then intellectual property uh, information uh, as well. So our collection, if we call it that, is very much the foundation of everything that we do within the Business and IP Centre. It's sort of the starting point. Uh, and we really um, promote this collection extensively through our online networks, through our marketing, our various social media channels, um, because uh, we find that entrepreneurs, those that have, have a new idea and those that are established, um, really can't find the quality resources free online through, say, with a, you know, Google or, or any other search engines, there's always going to be a paywall. So this is where um, libraries, or where we in particular, are able to um, step up and able to provide that access um, through the subscription content through our, our providers. Um, so uh, a provider like Mintel, which is very well known here in the UK as a market researcher, we're able to provide um, a, a fairly comprehensive um, selection of their reports, again, on whatever particular industry or niche um, that our, our researchers are, are looking for. We've calculated the whole value of the collection, and this is a rather conservative guesstimate uh, to be a, at least five million pounds uh, worth of information that our, our users, we call them readers, are able to access on site only. So they only have on site access with um, a library pass or reader pass, as we say. Uh, and so they are able to access all that content there. I should um, just point out, just while I'm talking about the, the resources, there is uh, possibilities for um, our users to actually download and take away um, certain sections of reports, but we staff will manage that process and we'll, be, and we'll do it very much in line with our agreements with each of um, the publishers and providers. That's a bit more about our databases, 30 plus business. Um, and when we look at it in context, that's part of over 10,000 uh, different um, subscription databases across the whole library. Uh, now you could imagine if you're just come off the street and you want to start researching, you maybe you've got a business idea, you want to get started and find out what you need to know. Um, it can seem like quite an overwhelming uh, first start to the day. Where do I even start to begin? And, and this is where um, our reference team are able to come into their own. Uh, we've got um, a team for, with many, many years experience uh, working in libraries and working in business information. We're able to kind of meet people as they come in and guide them whatever their research is um, just as a first, first start so that they make the most of their time 
uh, in, in the library and they are able to perhaps even take some, some very useful content away to help them form their business plan uh, or uh, they can create company lists for whatever reason, be it marketing or, or research on competitors and, and so forth. Now that's very much the, the foundation of, of what we do. It's the information and resources, but building on top of that is actually a whole suite of other services and programs. And this is where I perhaps want to focus a little more on today for you, um, just as, as something that maybe um, other libraries we know are doing, but this is how we're, we're doing it. And, and I must say, we, we got inspiration from another library in, in the United States, actually. Uh, the New York Public Library was, was doing some of these interesting uh, this interesting work, um, at Science Industry Business Library there, uh, Madison Avenue, um, they were doing um, workshops and one-to-one and -one advice and, and building up a network of partners uh, for the library. And we've basically you know, done something very similar with the model. Uh, we, as, as staff, we, we bring in um, partners and specialists that work with the library um, that are able to give workshops, um, many of them at a very, very subsidized rate. So our users don't have to pay very much to go to the workshops. Some of them are free. Uh, we'll get onto that in, in a moment. But this is very much um, the purpose of what we're doing. We want to create a network. We want to give um, our users not only the, the desk research, the published material, which is very, very important and absolutely essential to getting some sense of the business landscape and by way of what they're doing, but, but also some expertise, some real world expertise uh, from, from those that have run businesses and, and those that advise uh, on, on running a business as well. Um, some of the workshops that we, we run ordinarily, and, and I, I stress this is in normal times because now those workshops have magically become webinars in the last year, uh, a whole range of webinars, but this is the, the sort of topics that we'd cover, be it a workshop or a webinar as they are at the moment. Topics such as um, social media and using social media for small businesses that are teaching lean startup methodology, digital marketing, how to do market research from home, actually using what content there is available, uh, workshops on, on funding, how to get funding, the best ways to do that, whether it's appropriate for you as a startup or a scale up. Uh, financing options, so finance around how to manage your finances rather, and then other um, topics that pop up um, fairly regularly on assessing environmental impact for your business, uh, tips for developing your website, uh, and not um, no least uh, to mention the regular um, series of intellectual property uh, workshops and webinars that we run on a, on a weekly basis, on a, on a rolling basis every month. Um, the same Topics come up and they're always very well subscribed. And they are, of course, topics like uh, introduction to trademark searching, to patent searching, um, registered design, uh, and, and copyright uh, as well. So our, our users get an introduction to, to doing these, these IP searches or these prior art searches, knowing whether their idea or their brand is, is uh, likely or unlikely to infringe others um, so that they are they, they know their options and they can avoid some of the um, what are really quite significant pitfalls um, that they might encounter uh, as they grow their business. Now uh, a little bit of history to backtrack slightly on how we got our name business and IP. Um, the two are a, mar a marriage made in heaven I would suggest they very much complement each other and the reason we brought the, the, the two topics together if you like is because we have two separate collections which we merged, two separate teams which we merged way back in 2006. Um, so we, we brought the two together because it made very much uh, intuitive sense, but also on a practical level that when you're in a business, you can't do business with knowing about IP and you can't, you definitely can't see IP in isolation to running a business because the, it's part of the, the asset of the business, it's part of what you need to know, it's part of the value of the business. Um, what, what what IP that there is. So the, the two are very much complementary hand in glove to each other uh, and likewise the collection. So we merged that and, and the team together. Uh, so a few other services that we, we have on top of that, uh, we do run one-to-one uh, -one clinics. Uh, I myself run them, my colleagues. So those that are say wanting to get more specific IP advice exactly on an area that they are starting up in, maybe they have a new invention, they want to get some advice around what's involved in taking out a patent, how to do a patent search. Uh, maybe they're building a brand, they want to do a trademark search and so forth. They can spend an hour 
um, at the moment online at meeting and I'll, I'll guide them through what they need to know, give them a little bit of an action plan, give them uh, where appropriate flag up, where legal, legal advice is necessary um, and send them on their way. And we, we follow up and make sure that they, they get the ongoing support beyond us. And we integrate that with the rest of the programs that we run with the Business uh, Center of the British Library as well. And then we have uh, specialist partners that come in, uh, one particularly to flag up, uh, we have a partner who gives advice on product development, um, very important because that's complementary to, to a lot of IP. Uh, they might come in uh, and, uh, and run a session at a subsidized rate again, sort of 10 pound uh, an hour, sometimes a little bit more depending on the partner. So there you go, the, the, res the resources, the, the workshops, webinars, and then we have the events uh, and we run a regular series of events. Uh, we have promotional days, startup day, which is a big national event that we were a part of. Of course, World IP Day, we, we, we love, <laughs> we, we want to share all about, shout out loud about what we do and the content and how that links in with other, uh, our, our friends around the world as well. Uh, but in normal, normal times, we would run uh, what we call an inspiring entrepreneurs event where we bring in uh, well-known, sometimes quite famous household names, brands that we know uh, and have them come along and we will we'll use our, our conference space. We'll get 250 or so people in the audience and, and broadcast that, webcast that uh, live as well. So those that can, people can watch it from home too when we've had maybe um, these names, maybe not be so familiar to you outside of the UK, but Stelios who started at EasyJet, Alan Sugar, um, uh, with, with his businesses, uh, Levi Roots with the, the source, uh, just to, to name a few. Uh, and there's an actual example there of one of our events and promotional material there. In this case, it was uh, a, a celebration of black uh, British entrepreneurs and the various businesses um, and names that are, that are now quite famous household names here in the UK. But, but nonetheless, great opportunities for people to come together to network, to hear and be inspired. Um, by entrepreneurs and also to raise the issue of IP and to have people ask about IP and to have the speakers and entrepreneurs give their experiences of IP and how it's how it's worked for them and, and, and sometimes some of the issues they've had to encounter as well. So if you were to summarize us in a sentence or two sentences, if you've got an idea, we'll help you turn it into a business that's been very much part of our marketing and promotions now since we opened in, in 2006. And, and now, after all that time, we, we do have some stats. We've got some hard evidence here. Uh, we've been able to track the progress of, of many, many businesses over that time. And we found that people are four times more likely to be successful having used the business and IP center than not. Um, the average, sadly, business failure rate is, is one in 10 by year three. And we buck the trend um, uh, and uh, and Four, people are four times more successful um, in starting a business have, having used the center. That's quite a significant statistic. Now, just in the minute or two that I have, I, I realize we're a bit tight for time, but I just want to just mention to you a couple of programs that we have here, um, Innovating for Growth Scale-Ups and Startups. I, I used to work on the Scale-Up program. We bring in um, a, a number of businesses that apply for a, a position uh, and they would get um, a quarter, three months of tailored consultancy um, we would be funded uh, through the European Regional Development Fund, uh, and we provide them consultancy on strategy, uh, market research, uh, product development, uh, and we bring in intellectual property lawyers uh, so they get a full IP audit and advice um, around their IP as a scaling business. We've, we've worked with over well over 500 businesses um, since starting that program in 2012, and we've had that funding continue and thankfully been renewed over the years. Um, I just want to share just briefly a few of those case studies with you um, today. So one of the businesses, a compliment, um, uh, they've since been on the program, um, they've been able to um, scale up and increase their employees from three uh, to 12. And in fact, they've tripled their turnover. But one thing about coming to the library is that they are no longer so alone. They've been able to network and connect with the alumni from this program and, and many other businesses um, and get that mutual support from other entrepreneurs, but also the, um, the consultancy over that period of three months. And that's been a game changer for them. They've really been able to refocus and be re-inspired and re-energized. And that's been absolutely crucial for a business like Complement to grow and to scale, uh, to triple edge turnover and to increase um, their employees from three to 12. Stitch and Story, a similar um, 
uh, story here. Complement was, was, by the way, dealing with pharmaceutical regulation. Stitch and Story is, is, a, is a completely different uh, type of business. Uh, hobbyist, uh, uh, knitting online, um, it's big business. Uh, and they've grown significantly uh, now from four to 17 staff. They sell products online and they've had venture capital funding uh, as well. Uh, and they've, they've expanded from four to 17 staff. Uh, and they, uh, Jennifer, the founder there, um, credits the Innovating for Growth program for being uh, making a real difference to them and helping them to really re-see their business and also to reevaluate the, their IP. And that's been really important. They've had this IP check. Maybe they've had to, I know for compliment, they've had to go over their, their trademark and just get that as reestablished. Um, and particularly this last case study here for Longcroft, um, and this is a cat hotel, which has been now a franchise. They've expanded all over the country um, uh, to 23 locations, just starting out. Uh, and they have been uh, rated as the Guardian's most innovative business um, for, the, for that year. Uh, and they got a lot of help with the franchise side of things. Of course, IP is very important around that um, as the franchise model, uh, how, they, how they use that as an asset with the branding and, and so forth, uh, and the way of doing things, the, the know-how, the process of procedure, getting that all sorted. And that's been um, foundational for the, the, the business to really grow and expand and, and continue um, to be the success um, that they are. Uh, just by coincidence, they are the three female founders. Uh, after I chose those case studies, um, it, it just kind of dawned on me, oh my gosh, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, and actually, we bucked the trend on that as well. And that just under half all of the businesses on the scale up program are uh, female founders. And that that's very much goes against the, the national trend um, of female entrepreneurs by, by the national stats, which is a lot, lot lower. Now we have. Um, uh, we have a startup program for businesses as well, um, uh, and they are able to zone your runs for two days, not as extensive, but we do link um, um, the more promising startup businesses with the scale-up businesses. We run a, a mentoring program where we um, connect the host entrepreneur um, with the, the um, startup business, and the two will meet over a period of three or four months, and the experienced entrepreneur from the scale-up side will help the startup side. And with uh, a good number of those from the startup program have been mentored, grown to the minimum threshold of 100,000 pounds. That's for getting onto the scale-up program. And they've, they've found their way onto that program to get further support. So there's a connecting and a linking between our audience as well. And, and the Business and IP Center very much facilitates that, that possibility. Um, further to that, I just want to touch on some ongoing developments. Um, I, I won't focus so much on, on the, the, the local side of things. Um, but just so that you know, we have now a network of business and IP centers across the UK and the main um, central libraries for all of these cities. Um, they are very much, they do their own thing, but we support them um, with advice. We give, we give training, for example, in IP um, to their staff uh, and um, you know, we, we help them around running the workshops and the partnerships and so forth. Um, but it's very much a collaboration. It's a, it's, it's a mutual network. It's not us telling them what to do. It's not like that at all. It's, it's all about sharing the knowledge uh, and collaborating. Uh, and that's a really important development that we um, are, is an ongoing thing, whereas we increase the numbers of business and IP centers across um, the cities and, and regions across the UK. Not least on our very own doorstep, I just want to conclude on this, Startup in London Libraries, uh, coming to a high street near you, um, we are now starting to have business and IP centers in some of the main uh, London libraries as well. In fact, we run um, a, a, a day or two day uh, webinar for the London boroughs uh, and, and half of that is on IP. Um, uh, how do you protect a business idea? Uh, we explore what that actually means in practice and how IP can, can support uh, your uh, invention and creation and, and for protection and for longer term um, sustainability. And on that note, um, I will catch a breath. Uh, I think I've, I've said all I, I can in the time. I I'd love to speak more, but um, I, I'll stop now. And um, uh, But thank you for listening, and I hope that's been useful, and I'll be very happy to take any further questions uh, going forward. Thank you, everyone. So very many thanks, Jeremy. I mean, that's very, uh, you know, a, a, an amazing range of services that you're providing to the local communities um, in, in the UK and uh, in, in, your, in the region. Um, so from pharmaceutical to knitting to cat hotels, I guess it's all in a librarian's day's work. 
<laughs> Absolutely. You just never know what, what day the day is going to bring. That's yeah. part of the fun. <laughs> yeah, great. OK, so with that, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to now hand over to our second speaker, Tara, who's at an academic institution in the United States. Tara, the floor is yours. Thank you. That was wonderful hearing about Jeremy's work. Um, I'm going to speak briefly about what we're doing here um, at my academic institution from patent searches to makerspaces, we kind of call it, and how we are directly helping uh, businesses thrive and develop both on our on campus population and in the greater northern Nevada region. All right. So I'm briefly going to talk about who we are, who we help, and how we help. So we're the University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, we're a, a, a pretty big institution, uh, mid-sized, maybe as far as the US goes, about 21,000 students, over 145 academic majors. I have a map. We are in the Western United States. We're a little bit in the middle of nowhere. Um, our whole metropolitan area has about 425,000 people. Um, but due to some generous tax initiatives by our state government, our key industries are tech, advanced manufacturing and distribution and logistics. Uh, so we are home to one of Tesla's giga, uh, battery factories, excuse me. Um, Google and Apple have very large data centers here out in the desert. Uh, and Amazon has many, many warehouses. If you order something from Amazon in the Western United States, it's probably coming from Reno. Um, even though we're a smaller metropolitan area, again, less than half a million people um, and, and quite a, a ways away from any other um, population centers, we have a large startup support infrastructure. And I just kind of show this slide and Jeremy kind of mentioned the importance um, of, of becoming part of your community network. Uh, I'm kind of a one-man band intellectual property. So I think we might actually be a good a good model for anybody who's any smaller libraries out there thinking about kind of offering the support. We succeed because all of us together in our community offer niche little services that help businesses, but we all understand what the other does and we form a really great referral network. So uh, as previously mentioned, I'm actually the head of a science and engineering library here at the, the university. And of course our library primarily serves um, the geosciences, engineering, physical sciences. Uh, but we do have a makerspace that is open to everyone. Uh, we're a land grant institution. That means everything that happens here is supposed to directly benefit the people of our state. And so we'd like to make resources as open as possible when, when funding structures allow. And as previously mentioned, our, our makerspace also has a close relationship to local inventor and maker and entrepreneurial communities and support systems. So our makerspace, uh, it's free to access. We do charge for some of the materials so if you're going to 3D print, that sort of thing. Um, we have things like 3D scanners and 3D printers and vinyl and laser cutters and PCB milling machines and kind of, kind of the things that we've come to ex expect. Um, we're probably in the mid range of what a library makerspace looks like, um, certainly not an engineering lab or something like that. The real stars of our show are our student workers. And we're in Nevada, we're in cowboy country, so we call them maker wranglers. Um, and these are expert student employees. When we hire one, they go through three full, three weeks of 40 hour week training with us. It's a very intensive process to bring them up to speed. But once they're done with that training, they can teach anyone how to use anything in our makerspace and how to create content for anything in our makerspace. Um, it's not the laser cut that the laser cutter is tricky to use. It's how do you create the program files that, that it allows. And we can help people learn how to do that. So we're also a patent and trademark resource center. There are 83 of these in 47 states. And it's a program run by the USPTO, the United States Patent Office, based in um, Alexandria. And it began in 1871, but it greatly expanded in 1977, they did go west of Mississippi. And Reno was designated in 1983. So we have been a PTRC for short, for quite some time. And I have been a PTRC librarian for um, about seven years. Typically here at the University of Nevada, Reno, we have one or two librarians trained up by the USPTO to provide a service. And right now it's, it's one, it's me. And the PTRC mission, wherever it is, is to disseminate patent and trademark information, uh, support the diverse intellectual property needs of the public, 
And of course, uh, we have to stress we do not provide legal advice. Jeremy briefly mentioned that. Um, it's a big deal for us. We don't want to get in trouble. We are librarians. We are not legal experts, but there's still a lot we can do. So we help just about anybody. Um, UNR, um, campus students, faculty, and staff, of course, from a wide variety of disciplines. Certainly, I see a lot of engineers, but a lot of entrepreneurial students, business students. I've helped faculty with podcasts, copyright, things like that. And we also help the greater northern Nevada community. And it might be historical researchers, right? Genealogists who want to find a patent their grandpa had or something like that. But mostly it's small businesses, it's startups and entrepreneurs, makers, inventors. Um, we have a large artist community. If you've heard of the famous Burning Man Festival, that's just outside of Reno. Uh, so we often are talking to artists about their IP rights. And even the incarcerated, um, who I'll help um, anybody in prison, they'll often just send snail mail and we, we can provide some assistance there as they're talking about their IP. Here's just a couple of examples of, of people we've helped. This was a student group that won a campus uh, entrepreneurial contest. They custom make these completely amazing <laughs> band life kind of vehicles. And over on the left hand side, this was a community member who made the tactic key. And so he actually prototyped and designed his, his item here. And then we, we talked about the patenting process for him. So the makerspace has about three to 400 consultations a year. That's pre-booked. It's probably double that when we count all of our walk-ins. Uh, and our makerspace offers free workshops uh, and classroom instruction. And um, so we, we work with, we do a lot in that makerspace. It's a busy place. Um, and again, most of it is done by my um, Wranglers. You can see we're opened during COVID. We have been since uh, last July. And this is how we safely do some of our consultations. And so how we help in the IP range, we do individual consultations. Right now, since it's just me, it's about 100 a year. Um, and we also do free workshops in classroom and instruction. So at the top here, intellectual property design or in art and design, this is, this is a class I teach. Um, actually, I teach a very similar class to information science students as well. And this we're primarily talking, we give an overview of IP, but we're also talking about things like copyright, fair use is especially important as an artist. Um, and then we'll do just kind of wide variety of patent workshops. Um, think, do you think you want a patent? Come to this workshop and we'll kind of tell you what the process is, what they protect, what they don't protect, that sort of thing. So for the librarians in the, in the room, the consultation for intellectual property is just a reference interview. We're going to determine what the real need is and, and the type of intellectual property. Uh, it can be very confusing to people, to the, even the difference between a trademark and a design patent or an, and copyright. We give instruction on what IP is, what registration protects, what it doesn't protect, how to obtain it, how to search existing IP. We answer all the non-legal questions that we can, and we connect users to critical information. For, for me, that's a lot of USPTO resources and actually NOLO resources. Um, and we give referrals and information for next steps. So again, that's that importance of our local entrepreneurial supporting network. We use a lot of different resources um, in our consultations. So I'm gonna probably actually start with this BlastNet because it's a much friendlier database than the USPTO's PadFT for, for people who are brand new. But of course, I'm gonna use the PadFT, AppFT, Pair, Test, those sorts of things. Occasionally I'm using White, uh, Whitebow's Patent Scope uh, and Google Patents, and every librarian will use Google. We just we just do it a little bit more carefully. A common key concepts that come up when I'm, when I'm teaching about this sort of thing would be CPC classification, uh, function and hierarchy. Uh, librarians were made to teach <laughs> patents and trademarks. This, this is our, our bread and butter, right? So uh, things that we use in traditional research databases completely apply when we're searching intellectual property, existing intellectual property. I'll teach them how to search by assignee or applicant, the owner of the IP. Um, through that process, we learn how to read a patent, right? What, what, what do we learn from the, the classification of IP? How do, how do we see what the patent number is? And of course, like things like drawings and the all important claims. We, we talk about those places. And of course, how to access, download. And occasionally, I get questions about international protection. So like the patent cooperation treaty and the Madrid, Madrid protocol, I'll, I'll talk about that and explain that process and point out to more information. So I think Jeremy kind of touched on this too, but really our job is just to meet people wherever they are in their, their business journey and their IP 
in their IP journey. So sometimes people know exactly what they want and they just need me to kind of maybe point them to a few different resources, answer a few questions. And sometimes they have an idea, right? And, and it's a much longer process and we might go to the makerspace and prototype first and then they'll come back to me. And But, but we will meet people wherever they are. And occasionally, Sometimes it, we talk about when it makes sense to not protect their IP, so to speak, um, or at least not to um, register it in, in that sort of way. And some of the questions that we might have around this are, are who are they, right? Are they um, an artist or a mechanical engineer? Um, you know, are they an app developer, right? <laughs> what, what are their goals? Um, you know, we sometimes people just want to be able to share and share in a way, though, that gives them control, right? I want I want people to be able to use this and share it freely, but I don't want them to change it or things like that, especially when we're talking to our artist community. Um, and there's uh, and actually a lot of developers too. Uh, open source, open access. This is a common thing in in a lot of our disciplines, like physics and computer science and things like that. What's their product lifespan, right? We're kind of asking questions like that about intellectual property. Um, is it an app, <laughs> really, right? Um, uh, is, that, is that worth the process? In the US, it can take around 26 months on average from patent application to patent registration. It's not a quick process. And what are their resources? We also um, try to illuminate some of those things they might not think to ask about, right? There is no patent police. If you are going to patent something, you are the one who's going to go out and litigate it, right? Uh, and do you have the resources for that? So along with that, we bring up things like Creative Commons licensing, fair use. Um, the Creative Commons actually is a great toolkit for businesses. Um, fair use, there's some really great resources. I wanna say my favorite fair use is from the University of Minnesota uh, libraries. Um, and again, we, we talk about what it means to protect your intellectual property and, and what it what it means to have a Creative Commons license and share it. Um, and I think a lot of people um, are unfamiliar with the concept of sharing it freely, but also with some qualifications that, that make you as the creator comfortable with that share. And I'm going to wrap up nice and quick here. Uh, just a few uh, examples of who we help. Um, over here on the left side, you can see this root blue. So this was a couple of, well, one was an engineering student, one was a business student. They just hang out in our library all the time. And they decided they wanted to try to start a business. So they found these water bottles, right? And then uh, they bought wholesale and they um, designed a logo, right? And a name. And so we, I walked them through the, the trademark process. We talked about trademark, we, we searched them, they went through that process. And they successfully got their trademark um, and they, hope to turn this into kind of a lifestyle, leisure wear, maybe company. Um, down on the left-hand side, it's just kind of an example of like our makerspace um, facilitating some of this intellectual property work too. We have a museum um, that wanted to 3D scan a bunch of its artifacts that it, that it owns. Uh, and so we've been facilitating this. So this is a computer image grab of one of them recently. And so this, is a, this will be a, a copyright kind of instance where we'll put them online and, and we'll work with them about copyright and is it downloadable and, and, things, like, and things like that too. Up in the upper middle, this is coming up called the Humming Dock. Um, and you'll see this woman, she's holding a little um, cylinder thing to her chest. So we had a local doctor um, who came up with an idea of using the microphone in these headphones that essentially I'm wearing, right? So cell phones are the most prevalent piece of technology on the planet, smartphones. Uh, and they almost always come with a free set of headphones with a microphone attached. And so he had this great idea about putting the, the microphone into this concave cylinder. So on the back side, it's concave and it creates a stethoscope. And then there's a free app that downloads with it. So the idea is, is that maybe people in countries who do not have access to great healthcare or it's a long ways for them to travel, they could work with their doctor via this app and uh, a mother could check her heartbeat, her baby's heartbeat, children's heartbeat, things like that. So that was a really fun process that we helped him prototype using various 3D filaments in the makerspace first. And then we talked about intellectual property afterwards. At ClickBio, this is a local company. They, they prototyped all of their um, custom labware first in our makerspace. And then again, we talk about IP, trademarks for them. 
upper right hand corner, this is um, a, a sculpture. It's actually huge. It's big enough that you can walk. It's called Inside the Mind of Da Vinci. So you can walk along the backside into Da Vinci's mind. And there's kind of a little exhibit. Um, and we helped create that in the maker space. And then that was an artist. So we talked about copyright and derivatives and fair use and, and what she wanted to do with her work. And finally, this is just um, another example of kind of a unique use um, of how the maker space can assist, um, especially small businesses um, and, and startups. And, and this is a, a small medical business. And anyway, so doing research utilizing MRI machines, and they actually want to create a device that will that will feed in objects into the MRI. So in the MRI machine, typically they're doing research by flashing an image in front of someone and reading brain activity. And in this case, we're actually going to like can't use metal, right? So that's why he's, he's creating this very intricate wood wood piece and, and kind of slowly push them into the machine. And so again, we're just a nationwide network of patent and trademark resource centers. And that's really key because I'm, I'm a, a single person here, but I have a strong network behind me that will answer any email that I shoot out into our listserv and I learn a lot from them. And we have a maker space that's open to everyone. And we, we again will help everyone wherever they are in, in their intellectual property journey. But with that, I, I will pass the baton. Well, thanks so much, Tara. That was really, uh, really fascinating and, and very, very practical. And I would, if, if um, I would encourage anyone who has a makerspace or has an opportunity to visit a makerspace in their in their local library or or, or in another setting, um, you know, I really encourage you to do that. It's it's a it's fascinating and a, you know a great great way to experiment and to learn about all these fascinating new new technologies. So thank you very much. So now I'm going to hand over to our, um, our third speaker, uh, Bernadette. Um, Bernadette, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. So I'm here today to talk about Dublin City Library's support for business startup. And thank you for the invitation to be here. First of all, I'd like to give you a little bit of context on a national program called Work Matters which is part of our Public Library Strategy 2022, which aims at inspiring, connecting and empowering communities. So Work Matters builds on the foundation that the public library system in Ireland can help those starting a business or looking for work because of we offer free membership, we have information and support for jobs and business, we offer free internet and online services, and importantly, a place to research, work, and learn new skills. A concrete example is our own service, Business Information Centre, which is located in the Central Library in Dublin City, um, Dublin One. Pre-COVID, we offered uh, 54 hours of public service walk-in per week. And in that, we offered online subscription information databases available on our library PCs. So there were three dedicated PCs where you could only get access to a range of business information. We also cooperate with the delivery of the Start Your Own Business Workshops with Dublin City Leo, which is the local enterprise office. Dublin City Leo is charged with supporting um, businesses, startup and developing businesses for uh, business with uh, 10 or fewer employees that are registered with the Dublin City in the Dublin City area. Uh, there are some rules uh, around the businesses that they support um, and these, can, these are accessible on their website. The Start Your Own Business Workshops are a spring and autumn series of lectures delivered by um, business uh, consultants or companies, and they feature topics such as financial supports, what it means, are, are you cut out to be a, an entrepreneur and what does it involve, market research, business plans, tax, that and revenue, and, and as well as maybe marketing your business. We've also delivered presentations and business information help desks from the uh, company's registration office and the patent office over the years. There's a targeted book stock. There's a range of e-resources. 
periodicals on business topics such as marketing, management, law, accounting, and other topics. And we also provide a de dedicated work matters hub with Wi-Fi devices and access to printing. So this is the uh, work matters hub. It's a dedicated space. People can come in and book it. It sort of offers um, an opportunity for a bit of quiet um, space and facilities. Uh, there's targeted book stock, which are well used, and there's a curated e-resources. And as, along with that, there were a number of workshops in our activity room on the themes of business and employment. The service during COVID-19 uh, obviously changed. Since March the 20th of last year, we have not been in a position to provide direct access to the business information PCs in the libraries. While we were closed during different levels and we reopened a few times over 2020 for call and collect or browse and borrow, we weren't in a position to provide long-term or longer uh, study access to patrons and that was across uh, the situation. So we had to evaluate and sit down and think, okay, we have these subscription databases they aren't widely available. So how do we make them available now to our patrons? So we individually, we contacted four suppliers uh, through their, our relationship, their relationship managers. And what we negotiated with them was that they would allow staff to carry out the research on behalf of the patrons and provide a remote access a service in response to patron requests. So while patrons couldn't access the databases themselves because that wasn't uh, facilitated, we were able to provide a service that in response to their request, we could go and do the research for them. So we have uh, three librarians working on this since probably later last year. Um, the arrangement is that the research requests are accepted only by email. The patrons must be public library members, but you can join online. And after we receive the um, research request, the patron or the member of the public is required to read and accept the relevant database terms and conditions, come back to us and say, yes, I've read and I accept them in advance of receiving any information. The research databases are probably well known to you. And the four that I'm including today are Mintel, Euromonitor, Ibis World, and Marketline. They're all quality databases. They use quantitative data along with quality qualitative analysis by their, by their analysts uh, to provide both um, reports, insight, trends. After that, it's a matter of what you subscribe to. For I know Jeremy mentioned Mintel. So our subscription to Mintel includes the Irish uh, reports, uh, and it's an all-Ireland uh, Irish report, consumer uh, research on a range of uh, topics such as finance, uh, leisure, um, lifestyle, uh, um, finance, and also they, they also deal with food, which is very important in terms of, of local industry. Euromonitor Passport, we have a subscription to 45 geographical areas and it covers topics and a range of sectors and services uh, throughout the world. And it includes also a COVID-19 recovery uh, tracker. Ibis World, we have a subscription to their U United Kingdom uh, reports as well as the Irish reports. And they include um, the impact of Brexit uh, and also the impact of COVID-19. Market line very well used by our uh, patrons who are business students because of their, uh, their insights and their pestle analysis of different cities and countries. They also provide company information, uh, information on significant business deals. And also they, they track uh, key influencers in business on social media. So who uses the service? Individuals interested in researching Irish and global markets, uh, members of the public who attend the Start Your Own Business workshops, they're re recommended to uh, come into the library or to access the library resources, uh, business students and tutors, and we've also had staff from some of the embassies based in Dublin contact us. So examples of uh, research requests, I just looked at some over the last, say, three to six months. 
the future of the hotel sec uh, sector in Ireland 2021, which is showing obviously the impact of COVID-19. The market for sustainable cosmetics, which was also the impact of COVID-19 and where the business person said to us that they had to pivot their business focus. Market for beverages in Armenia, market for luxury jewelry from a, a business startup and changes in retail, how, you know, what percentage of people and attitudes towards people say, for example, purchasing online. Um, market for a soft toy with a bedtime recording for children for somebody else who was interested in making their craft into a, a, a business. The first quarter research just shows us the categories uh, where um, most of the uh, reports um, related to food and drink, food and hot drinks relating to Ireland and then Europe and markets elsewhere, specific market sectors in Ireland and that covered things like waste management, pharmaceutical companies, um, household appliances, and again, mainly in the Irish market, clothing, accessories, and jewelries, and that was spread over Europe and Ireland, skincare, grooming, personal hygiene, again, more, uh, re more reports issued relating to the European situation, um, agriculture, mining, construction, and the rental of machinery, and then we go down to telecom telecommunications and the internet also featured strongly. So um, reflections, the, the service was promoted on a very gradual basis. And the reason for this was uh, we could only negotiate with the supplier when their, um, when their renewal for their subscription occurred. And also staff initially when when we had to leave the library on the 12th of March last year because of the first lockdown in Ireland, we literally went out the door and just a few people had access to laptops. Over time, sir, um, staff have now been equipped with access with laptops and uh, mobile phones, access to uh, training and um, access to key files that are on our local network. There is an increasing number of inquiries received and satisfied in the first quarter of this year in comparison with last year. And in particular, in March of this year, we, uh, we wrote and published blogs on each of the, um, the databases. And since then, and possibly a little bit beforehand, we're seeing a, a, a good increase on, on the inquiries received. Significantly, staff knowledge and experience has been enhanced by the process. And this is because uh, previously um, there was some sort of like mystique or there was a perceived mystique, I think, around the business databases that they weren't for everybody. But looking back now, I think the case was we were never in a position to offer such excellent training online that we have been able to do now. So we can bring a whole team together with the service provider and we've had two to three training sessions with a number of them. So previously staff might have had to spend time, you know, researching and developing and the, the, the knowledge and expertise, uh, experience themselves, whereas now we have been able to, fa to fast track this. Um, these are the useful links if you wish to read more, the Work Nat Matters National Programme, Dublin City Library's Work, Ma Work Matters Programme, and promoting the services relates to the blogs that were, were written and promoting uh, the databases. These are the people who actually deliver the service, Sandra Godkin, Terry and Owen, and Damien Flynn, who's been of, of enormous assistance. So thank you for your attention and for listening. Well, thank you so much, uh, Bernadette, and I think another uh, amazing range of, of services and, and you're really also helping with the real kind of hard business end of the business in terms of tax and VAT and revenue and all of that as well. So another dimension to the services that we've heard about before. And I think I've probably heard three, three messages, elements coming through. Um, I mean, you've all talked about the having access to quality up to date resources many of which are only available through a, a paywall and are quite expensive, as we've heard. Um, also that the second, that the collections are curated collections. So they're, you're able to provide expert guidance to the relevant resources. 
for the entrepreneurs and also that you're meeting people where they are in their business journey. So whether they're starting or whether they're refreshing or whether they're pivoting to something new, then you're able to, to provide that expert support. So, so I really, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, amazing um, the range of, of the resources. So with that now, I'm gonna hand over to Stephen. Um, we have a couple of uh, questions in the Q&A and uh, Stephen, over to you. So th thank you very much, and I'd just like to echo everything that Teresa has said about how rich, how, uh, how valuable all that you're doing is, but also how clearly you've presented and showed this role. So I guess you, you've probably been able to see the questions that are in the, the Q&A function, the Q&A box. Um, I'm going to ask both of them at the same time and add a quick one myself because we only have a couple of minutes left. So the first question focuses on how you go about marketing what you're doing? How do you make sure that as many of those businesses or people thinking about starting businesses who could benefit from your services are hearing about them? A second one linked to what Teresa was saying about paywalled resources. Um, many of these resources are too expensive for libraries in many countries. And so are there recommendations on where you can find, where it's possible to find cheaper resources? Are there options? Are there partnerships? And I guess the quick question I wanted to add in on the end was, for you, what is the value added of libraries being involved in this? Why should libraries be part of efforts to promote entrepreneurship in addition to all the other work that's going ahead? So I'll stop with that and suggest that each of our, can, each of our, our panelists answers these together. Um, I'll ask Jeremy to go first, we'll go in order of interventions. Uh, so on, on the, the question of, of promoting the service, um, <clears throat> We, I think we are quite privileged in the sense that we, with the National Library and, you know, have, have this profile. So to then promote the business services off the back of that, I think is a lot, is a lot easier perhaps than, than, than other libraries. Not, nonetheless, it's, it's still a case of attracting new audiences constantly. Um, it's still um, flagging up what we do. And, and actually the, the barrier that we find is, is more uh, people's perceptions of library. They don't, libraries, they don't often uh, think of libraries and business advice uh, in the same sentence. Uh, so we have to do a little bit of a sell around, actually, we are relevant to you uh, and we've got lots of really useful stuff that's gonna be very helpful to you. Oh, and by the way, you meet some other cool people uh, along the way. So um, that's a constant messaging challenge that we have to get out. And the way we do that is through good content, uh, on, through blogs, uh, the events with, with speakers uh, on, on very relevant topics that, that entrepreneurs will be interested in attending. Uh, that's a really crucial thing as well. That's around the marketing. Uh, and if we have a little bit of budget left over, we'll, we'll go a little more public with, you know, with some, some press, uh, good relationships with, with, uh, with the daily newspapers. Uh, other trade press is also, I think, very helpful. Uh, and every now and then we might splash out on, on a billboard or something just to kind of keep our, our names out there. So, um, you know, make of that what you will, but perhaps a combination or any one of those things might be a good start for any library to, to look at to to help promote the services. Uh, would you like me to comment on, on the other two or should I leave some comment for, for others? If, if, if you feel like you've got something so quick to add, like no sentence on each or? Yes, so um, just, just briefly, and I, I don't want to hog up the time, but on, on the, uh, I understand the, the challenges of subscriptions and, and cost. Um, well, I, I, absolutely that's the case, um, but there's a two way street here. Um, the more you, we can be seen to be relevant and promoting our service, the better position we are to talk to our providers to get good terms. It's a, it's, it's a win-win in a sense. They get their brand recognized in front of more SMEs. Um, that's useful. Uh, and that there's a nice association that market researchers are helping the SME community. So there's, there's a, there's a two-way street there. Um, you can, I think negotiate on in terms of licenses, be it academic license. Uh, they are different to corporate licenses. So I think there's there's conversations to be had around that. This is common across the industry. So you know, push that if you can. Um, and the uh, sorry, I've forgotten the, the last question. There was it something around that you mentioned there, Stephen. Was the well, the, it's the the, the the USP of libraries in this ecosystem. Oh. <laughs> How can I forget? So the USP is actually. It's, it's the expertise that we can make this information make sense to you. 
Uh, it's not just words on a page, it's how we can make that relevant to you as an individual right now. And we've had that message come through, clear through our speakers, making it relevant to you. <clears throat> and actually, it's a very lonely thing being an entrepreneur and the more people can, can tap into networks and other people to have these discussions, that's a real value add. That's the uniqueness that libraries provide. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And over to you, Tara. Great. Um... The, uh, the first question was about marketing, right? Um, I would say, you know, we, we don't have a budget to, to market our, our sorts of resources either. So everything I'm doing is by thinking about where the entrepreneur is going to go. Jeremy's absolutely correct. No one thinks of the library, right? To, to help you start your small business, but they'll go to banks. And most of the small banks in Reno have some sort of lending program. And I met that lady at an entrepreneurial uh, event. And I was like, given my cards to those people, right? So I build connections with where I think entrepreneurs are going to go first. It's actually the same with our maker space too. Um, and it, I would also just quickly add the importance of your web presence. Um, everybody Googles everything. And so when you Google 3D printing in Reno, my maker space, I want it to be the first result that comes up, right? So I work with, that's something we can afford to do. We can make sure our SEO is, is good. Um, so let's just briefly, we don't have a budget, so it's all about word of mouth and, and our web presence for that. Um, for the resources, um, the way we, we um, subscribe to things like Mintel, we, we can't allow the public to use it at our institution. We cannot afford the extra in addition to providing it to 21,000 students. Um, so we look at the things we can provide. And so next door is my colleague, Christy, and she's a GIS expert. Um, and there's a wealth of freely available census information. And so we can at least help them do things like maybe we're going to map out where, where your target market is, right? And who's your target market? Things like that. Um, and I will say I can't find it quickly, but if you do some searching, you might be able to find it. Boise State University. I met a librarian there and she teaches a class about how to do um, good research post-graduation. So how do you do it after you don't have access? to the subscription resources. And she works with the entrepreneurial program. So if I find that, I'll try to share it. Um, and finally, why, it, why it's libraries. Um, at least in the US, um, the Pew Research uh, Center says that 78% of Americans believe that they can trust the library to give them the correct information. Um, in a country where nobody seems to trust anybody <laughs> anymore, um, that's pretty comforting. And so people know they can come to us and we're going to do our very best to help them. That's really what the library is, right? We, we provide expertise and access to information, um, but they trust us to have their intention, their, their best intentions at, at, at heart here. So that's, that's all I'll say about that. Perfect. Thank you. That was super clear. And finally, I'll hand over to Bernadette. Thank you. Um, in terms of marketing or promoting, we use um, blogs, we use um, our website, and then there's a national um, website on work matters. So I suppose using local and, and national has supported us. Um, we will also target promotion around key national enterprise events. So national and our local enterprise week is the first week of March. There was also works and skills week. There can be women in, in entrepreneurship. So, so keep an eye out and you can get sort of an added sort of um, um, uh, benefit by, by promoting when people are already looking at other areas around um, entrepreneurship and business. In terms of the subscription databases, um, I, I agree with what Jeremy said, there may be some room uh, to negotiate, but also you may need to think about what's if you if you can only and, and money is limited everywhere. If if you can only choose one, what is the one that you might want to, based on your client needs? And um, the other thing is there would be an awful lot of very good resources relating, I would imagine, to government uh, supports for business. So and these can all be curated and signposted into meaningful ways for the public for members of the public. In terms of our unique selling point, it, it's for, for the Irish public libraries, they're free, they're trusted, there is uh, expertise, and we're all cooperating really well now in terms of, um, if you go into a library in Dublin, you can borrow and return items in another part of the country. And I suppose we try and support each other in a network. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a useful answer. And I, I think you summarised it very nicely, Brenda, at the end with the 
the value being it's free, so it is accessible to everyone. And Jeremy had made that really interesting point earlier on that actually there's a matter there's a disproportionate number of women using the British Library services. So again, it's great as reaching out to people who may not otherwise benefit. The trust, as you said, Bernadette, as Tara said, and of course the expertise again, as you Bernadette and Jeremy said. So hopefully some really good strong arguments for making libraries part of that ecosystem of SME support. And with that, I'd like to hand back to Teresa to close us out. Okay, well, I'd like to uh, say thank you very much to, to all our speakers. I'd uh, like to say thanks very much to all the attendees for, for tuning in. Um, and if you're a librarian, uh, we hope that you've been inspired by some of the services that you've, you've learned about today. If you're a policymaker, we hope that you're inspired to partner with a local library to, to start up a service as well. So, um, so with that, uh, I'd like to say, yeah, thank you very much once again. Thanks all for coming and um, uh, happy World IP Day. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.